Are you ready? It's going to be a great program. Good evening and welcome. My name is Jennifer Summers. I'm the Director of Education here at Houston Ballet. Um, and I have to say that from the moment Stanton um, told us last year around this time that he was commissioning Trey to do a ballet in celebration of the 50th anniversary, I, I couldn't wait for tonight um, for a, a many reasons, but one of them is I wanted to be able to say, Trey McIntyre, this is your life. <laughs> at Houston Ballet. And I know, I mean, it's been thrilling for the dancers and the artistic staff and everybody to have him back here creating a new work. And I know you're as excited as I am to hear about this incredible new piece. Um, but before we get to that, I want to introduce the rest of the panel, though I am pretty sure I don't really need to do that. Um, sitting to my left is former principal dancer Don Scannell. She's here in a couple of roles. One is as a dancer, and she told me tonight absolutely all of Trey's work that he created here prior to Pretty Things. True? I think so, yeah. Plus lots of stuff that maybe you haven't seen um, that was more workshoppy, right? Uh, but really just a collaborator with Trey as he be became the choreographer that he is uh, today, as well as um, she, she has functioned as a stager for his work and gone on not just to dance in it, but to set it on other dancers um, throughout the country. So welcome to Don. And then to Trey's left, I don't, again, I don't really need to introduce these folks, but we have Connor Walsh who uh, joined Houston. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always forget. Connor joined Houston Ballet in 2004 and was promoted to principal dancer in 2007. And to his left, Harper Waters, <laughs> who joined Houston Ballet in 2011 and was promoted to soloist in 2017. And before we get started, I, as the director of education, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that all three of those gentlemen began their, their careers at Houston Ballet in the Houston Ballet Academy. Okay, Trey, get ready. This is where we're starting. <laughs> so tell us a little, tell us how you got to Houston Ballet Academy. When, how did that, your journey here begin? Uh, let's see. Um, by the way, just I want to say thank you. It's so nice to see so many friendly, lovely faces and all the hugs from uh, good friends, old and new. It's great to see you all. Um, I was at, uh, going to high school at North Carolina School of the Arts as a ballet major, and um, I was, uh, my interest was already so focused on choreography when I was at school, um, but back then there were no opportunities for ballet majors to choreograph, and so I've always been an enterprising fellow, and I would just grab dancers and choreograph just kind of because I had to, but I got a lot of uh, support from what was then called the modern department. Um, and they just took notice of what, of what I was doing. I say that because it's called, they call it contemporary now. Um, it's these kids these days, because they're new, <laughs> newfangled words. Um, so, but the, the contemporary faculty was, uh, they, would, they were my mentors. Um, Houston, and I'm not sure if this is still the case, but at the time, uh, there was always a summer choreographic yes. mm -hmm. workshop. Oh, yeah. We have yeah. Got, we're sending two dancers there this summer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, and so, you know... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, oh, you mean AFA in the summer the... intensive? No. No, no it, 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 it was basically seven students from the summer workshop would get to be choreographers on the rest of, of so the So you students. came here through the summer intensive? I did, yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, when, when Houston was in uh, North Carolina auditioning for the summer program, they asked the modern faculty, is there anyone you would recommend for the program? And thank you, thank God, they recommended me for it. Mm -hmm. There would have been no other connection that way. Um, and so I, I came in the summer, and I, you know, I have to really say I, I was fairly disenchanted with dance um, from being in high school at School of the Arts, and was kind of like Houston was kind of a last ditch thing. I was going to completely bag the whole deal, um, and I came and did that summer workshop. And um, I mean, not only was it such an amazing opportunity to get to choreograph, it was back then three works in the summer, but also my. M the reason I love dancing in the first place and the whole reason I started was reignited by being a part of this environment and the school was such a positive experience for me. It just set me right back on that path. 
So you, so basically, you're, I was, my next question was, when did you start choreographing here? But you came here as a choreographer. Yeah, I actually started when I was 11. That's when I made my first piece. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Because, um, so I, you know, I started dancing in Wichita, Kansas. And, um, you know, ballet, it's so boring when you're 11 years old. And, like, it's so repetitive. And, like, Tondu. I know, I know you guys aren't like that now with Tondu. You guys totally love him in class. But, it's but. a slow, begin, slow beginning. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, but my, you know, my creative brain was already on, oh, I've got this new material. Um, clearly, somebody's making these combinations we do in class. I just started choreographing naturally. That was, my, that, that was my impetus. But this is the story I always tell about how I really started choreographing was, um, I guess I was 12. I'm kind of bragging 11. <laughs> well, I was 12. Sorry. Uh, I was, uh, I used to skip class a lot. Like my mom would drop me off at ballet class and I'd go, like I'd go get a Slurpee next door or something like that. And um, there was one day I was in the parking lot showing some friends um, some steps I'd made up. Um, and my teacher was watching me th uh, from the class I was supposed to be in. She was looking out the window. So, um, and she came outside and she asked me what I was doing. And when I told her, instead of, uh, instead of me being in trouble, she's like, why don't you come in and teach us the rest of the class instead of doing it in the parking lot? Um, I thought that sounded pretty good. And so I, you know, she brought me in and, and really from that point forward, I thought of myself as a choreographer and I always thought, um, you know, going through School of the Arts, being in the academy, that always, and even in my time in the company here, this felt like this is my schooling and my preparation to become a choreographer and, you know, getting to learn from, and speaking of, you know, getting to the mind-blowing experience that was getting exposed to Christopher Bruce at that young age when all I had ever known was Tondu's um, was so, it was so incredibly impactful on me. So I, you know, really until the time I left the company, I always felt like this is me developing my, my art as a choreographer. So you, when, once you were, and once you were here in the summer intensive, you stayed, you were invited to stay for the year. Yes. And then, okay. And then, so do, were you choreographing in your time in the academy when you were here year round? Yes, quite a bit. And, um, you know, Ben Stevenson made a lot of opportunities for me in that way. And in fact, there was one, t there was a company choreographic workshop that happened when I was still in the school where the company members were making pieces. And so I got to be a part of that. So I That's was, you know, a, a teen getting to work with these professional dancers at Houston Ballet. And then when you joined the company, those opportunities continued? Yes. Um, so um, Ben created a position for me in the company of uh, choreographic apprentice. Did that happen right when you joined the company? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's how it started. Um, and then later evolved into being a member of the Corps de Ballet. And then when I left the Corps, I was choreographic associate mm -hmm. for a number of years. So, let's, so you talked about Christopher Bruce. What other choreographic inspirations... Or, or not inspirations, but influences, would you say? Well, I mean, no, not to mention Ben Stevenson. I mean, I, all the time I'm in the studio, like things just pop back into my head that I learned about, so much about uh, the storytelling of dance and how to communicate character. Um, that's with me all the time. I mean, I get to work with Kenneth McMillan and Margot Fontaine and um, Yuri Killian. I mean, le legends of the dance world, um, you know, in the last years of their, of their lives. How incredible to get yeah. to work with these people. Yeah. All right, so let's take a little um, walk through your choreographic, your company choreographic history. Um, so starting with Skeleton Clock um, in 1990, can you tell us a little bit about that piece? Yeah, I had, um, I had this massive, I was gonna use the uh, Dvorak Symphony mm -hmm. um, with a huge concept and um, I brought it to Ben and he's like, Calm down," he said. <laughs> he's like, he said, "Let's maybe do something for your first work a little bit simpler." So I, um, I uh, is a John Adams piece called "Fearful Symmetries," um, that was really more or less was an abstract dance dance work based on the movements of a clock. Okay, great. Um, and and then we had um, oh, this is you working on with Don. You can see Don a little bit of Don on Kurapira. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Kurapira. Skinny. <laughs> 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 yeah, Kurapira. That yeah. was um, that was the second piece for the company, and that was uh, let's see, a percussion work by Neho Saro um, that was played live. And I remember it had, gosh, this is really down. Um, all uh, like really weird instruments. Like I remember like uh, wine glasses and um, pots and pans and things like that. Um, and I remember there was a long, there was a section in the work that was all the. The, the floor was miked, and it was the percussion of, uh, of the women's point shoes was part of the music. And that. you added that into the score? Yes. Did someone write the score for you, or was it existing? No, I just found the CD at Blockbuster, like we had to do. Back in the day, we Back then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day. So, so that's, I mean, basically, with 
you reference the Dvorak in the first piece. So music is a place where you start generally. Yeah, um, generally, and especially back then, music yeah. would be the the launch pad. I mean, I, I was just talking about this today. Um, I don't know if I could tell or not. Christopher Bruce is studying the piano. You guys, he's learning how to play the piano. But he and I are the opposite. I actually started out um, playing the piano. That yeah. was my music was my in to dance uh, for all of this. So it's the place that I start. I, that's not always the process. Now sometimes it's a concept I have that I want to find music to fulfill. Right. Um, but I will always be I will always be so respectful of and um, careful with the music. Um, I'm very careful to not merely exploit the music or, or merely illustrate what's already happening because I feel like, well, an artist already did that. Right. Um, it's, it's my job to uh, add level to it, to add depth to it, to add a different perspective, to stand next to it, to stand on top of it. Um, that's what I have to do, and so I, I do that with a lot of careful study. I mean, I'm, I'm right now going through two s massive extremes. I just got back from a premiere in San Francisco with San Francisco Ballet, which is a Proko the Prokofiev Second Piano Concerto, um, which has long passages that are at liberty with the pianist, mm -hmm. and you know, making that relationship uh, work with dancer to, to um, musician is so intense. And then coming to music like David Bowie, which is right. more square, like pop music, it couldn't right. be uh, more of an extreme. But I, I treat each one with the same level of, of care. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so we're moving on to um, Touched in 1994. I think we have another oh, Dawn yeah. moment over there somewhere. Yes, we do. Tell oh, us yeah, about, that's us. Uh, <laughs> that's you two together, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, t so that came from, I, so there was, I guess there was more than one choreographic workshop because that, that started as part of a choreographic workshop with Houston Ballet. Yeah, there was, so this piece has four songs and so the two, first two, <clears throat> the first two were made for the workshop. Um, and I remember this piece was, it was, this is so stupid. It was a little bit of a protest on me because like the dancers, we really wanted lighting for the show, but we weren't allowed to have lighting. We just had to have the lights on and off. So it was like, okay, well, I'm just going to make it in the dark with flashlights. So the whole piece is made with flashlights that are, that are moving through the dark. Um, and so that went, so we did that. And then, um, so then uh, Ben asked for it to be a part of the, part of the rep. And so I later expanded it into a And they a gave full. you lights. Yeah, and then I had lights as, <laughs> as well as flashlights this yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one is second before the ground. Oh, look at this picture. I forgot I put this one in here. Oh, that's, yeah, that's still that's touched. That's still touched. Yeah. Uh, this is second before the ground in 1996 and more dawn. Yeah, more a lot of yeah. dawn in these for sure. Um, yeah, so this piece was part of the Cronus Quartet recording Pieces of Africa. Um, and um, it was really a piece that was about joy and about... Um, um, unashamedly and without irony, embracing that the expansive feeling of joy. Yeah. yeah. Why? So why the title then? Second before the ground. Uh, it means it's that feeling of bounding through space, and when you're at the climax of just that liberation before you go splat, the last like <laughs> wonderful feeling of it is that In last second before yeah. the ground. Yeah. Got it. I like that. All right. And then the, we've got bound in 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Bound. Um, so that piece was about kind of the contrasting um, meanings of bound, meaning like, uh, especially in partnering, you know, that feeling of being able to bound through space and that expansiveness, how we do that, has to be tethered to a partner. It takes another person. So there is um, <clears throat> that binding feeling of, that, that comes from partnering and that touch, um, that how one is dependent on the, on the other one. Okay, great. So uh, but I'm going to stop here because there's more work to talk about. But basically in all of these, the, the design elements f factor in, it cl it's clear to me, even though I haven't seen these works, because uh, I wasn't here then, um, and, but just looking at the imagery and, and knowing what's coming in pretty things, that set design and, and costume design are a really important part of your concept. And I'm wondering, um, you know, and you don't always see that in one-act ballets, ones that don't have stories per se. Can you talk about how you... Yeah, with a concept, how you come to the design part of it? For sure. Um, you know, a, a part of the concept appears through conversations with the designer, although some of these pieces were, um, that I, were my designs originally. Um, I think because I didn't know how to work with a designer, I didn't know how to make that conversation work, and I didn't have the relationships yet with people that I trusted with something that was so personal. Um, now those relationships are so important to me, and part of it comes from having to justify the work. Um, if I we're trying to, in dance, communicate something that's not, it's not possible with words. That's why we're, we're dancing it. We're touching on things that there's, there isn't the language for. And so 
with a designer, I have to find a way to articulate. I have to find a way to get them on the same page so it's not merely a decoration for what I'm doing, but that we're all saying the same thing. And so I value that process of someone who's thoughtful about their piece of the puzzle grilling me and asking questions and challenging and saying, well, here's a better idea than what you had and me fighting, you know, like that, that push and pull ends up, it ends up, sh ends up being a part of what the piece is, and, it, and it, it, it forces me to then walk into the studio on the first day, really knowing my my stuff because it's you know it's been it's Did been you on work the, through it with the designer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we've got the the last one act I have a picture of um, is the shadow, which was uh, in in two thousand and three. Do you want to talk a little bit about this one? This one seems yeah. like a little bit more of a narrative. Yes, it was The Shadow came after uh, Peter Pan, and when I, I was just so interested in, in narrative and telling stories. And so The Shadow was a collection of four Hans Christian Andersen stories um, kind of told as, as a collage. So it was another experiment in, in storytelling. Okay. And so now you've transitioned us beautifully to Peter Pan. Is this your, is this your only full length? Yes. Um, there you are rehearsing it in 2002. So we've got you documented through the decades. Cool. And, and a couple images from the ballet. So, so, so how did the full length come about? And, and what, how is your process um, for a full length different than a one-act ballet? Um, it, it, was, it was a long path uh, to coming onto the stage with uh, Houston Ballet. It was actually a different company that had originally commissioned uh, Peter Pan. Um, and I started working on that piece, and I, I had really never considered doing it. I didn't think that was within my wheelhouse, and I, um, but I, yeah, it was, I was a good person, I think, for the story of Peter Pan. That's a story that resonates with me. Um, and so I was working on it, and about a year into it, the company decided they didn't have the resources to produce it. But the team that I had put together for that, we just really loved each other, and we were loving the process. So we, we, we thought, let's just keep going. We kept working on it. Um, and it really came to, I wanted advice. It had gotten to a point where I, I came to Ben and I asked him, I said, well, what do you think about this? Like, what, what would make it better? And his only response was, he invited me to come uh, finish it with, with Houston Valley. So that was, that was a good response. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, by the time it actually got to the stage, I'd been working on it for three years. Um, and I, I, I will say that's the reason I really haven't endeavored further with full-length ballets, because I think that's a big commitment, three years. Like, on the, on the front end of that, it's hard to say, what story can I, you know, live with for that long? Um, but I, I felt like by the time I got to the studio with Peter Pan, I knew every detail of every character, of every core member. It was actually quite easy to choreograph. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, speaking of design, like, for a full-length ballet, you know, the, everything on that stage has to really, has to support what's happening. Right. And so there was so much back and forth and let's try this and let's try this. And, and because I was also working with an arranger um, using existing songs, but it, it's not obviously an existing um, um, orchestration cool, yeah. of, of, of that score, um, you know, searching and finding, you know, all the music was by uh, Elgar and, and finding, well, th let's see if this works and kind of like, creating that. And it, it's interestingly, I, I think, quite similar to putting the songs together for this Bowie piece. Mm. You know, having these disparate, disparate things that weren't meant to be heard together, but they still need to feel like a symphony. As you move through this, this music, it needs to have its own life as you progress through it. So in, in, in that way, it was similar. Yeah. But, but not, you don't have another one that you're thinking of, a full length? I am, but I won't tell. Okay. I'm working, I'm working on it right now, yeah. Oh, exciting. Um, Don, I, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit, since you were in all of Trey's ballets, um, a little bit um, uh, what it was like dancing in his work and what you think, mm, as, you, as, you, as he and you grew through it, what, what makes his work distinct? What makes a ballet a Trey ballet? Or other things that connect the Hard. Work? Yeah. <laughs> so work is uh, music, mm -hmm. musicality. Uh, openness as a dancer you had to stay if you were going to come into a studio with Trey you knew you had to be ready and stay open the whole time and because ideas were going to this what I felt back then ideas were going to come at you and you needed to be able to do them and create his thought process and what he was what I thought he was seeing in his head and what right. we all thought uh, that was important and that's great process to be a part of, but uh, difficult but on a daily get, basis. Not get which uh, you guys attached to anything that you maybe do in one rehearsal. When you say open, is that what you mean? Like don't, don't, work, don't get too attached? Whatever he wants, you do. <laughs> That's it. 
<laughs> and do it as best you can. But it, the ideas and the, it, it, he, I just remember you gave us lots of visual things. And for me, that was fantastic because sometimes my body wouldn't do it. And then the visualization was like, oh, yeah, right, okay. And so. Uh, image to oh, make the movement yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you feel like that that's the process? Are there, are, there, are there things about his ballets in the finished product that you think connect them all? Well, the story, mm -hmm. so many stories from beginning to end, and you don't see it while you're doing it because he's putting other pieces together, and then when everything is finished, second before the ground was joy. Like he said, that felt joyous. We felt that, and that's what he was trying to create. Uh, uh, Peter Pan, the serious characterizations in that. Everyone had very deep characterizations that he created. So it was about story, which is interesting to hear you say, because that's how we grew up with Ben. And uh, it was helpful that I was kind of in that era as well, thinking in terms of that. And so that helped me to help him. I, we didn't always achieve it. I mean, there were some times where he would come back and be like, wow, that was really not good. <laughs> oh. You mean come backstage after a show? Or in the middle of a rehearsal? <laughs> no, well, um, no, I never wanted to disappoint him. Yeah. And uh, because it, we all cared so deeply about what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we were in Washington, D.C. once, and we were doing second before the ground, I'm going to die. And we, we had a rehearsal, and he was like, wow, you guys, that really was not very good. And I was just like, heartbroken. And then I just went, what do we need to do? Yeah. <laughs> so it was immediate, but it, was, it meant so much mm -hmm. when he was happy. You know, to, as a dancer, you want to fill a, fulfill a choreographer's thoughts mm -hmm. and what they see and what they feel. That's a big responsibility, and you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So when you t take his work and stage it on other dancers, what are the, what are the uh, challenges of that that you, you know, as a dancer you wanted to bring his vision to life, but as a stager yeah. you have this other responsibility to, to, to bring his vision out of other dancers. What are the things, the challenges that you face? That's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. As a dancer, it's, it's, it's very singular. Mm -hmm. It's what you need to do, and then you see how you connect with the rest of the ballet that's going on around you, and maybe you can help here or there, you know. But, uh, or making things work like clockwork and, you know, uh, the sensibility of things. But when you're staging his ballets, there's a preciseness and uh, um, a detail that must be there when you're giving the information to the dancers or else they can, uh, to hold all that, to me that's very dear, to hold all of that, um, what I think he may feel. But then I always go back to school. We were together when uh, I staged uh, his Peter Pan. And then after staging it and all the details and the characterization and the things coming in and out and people flying and all of that, and then he came in and just sitting next to him listening to what he had to say and it just felt like going back to school. I was just like, oh gosh. I was right. <laughs> writing down things and just, it, I wrote down all his notes and I keep them with me so then when I come back to stage it, I implement those things so hopefully it gets less and less but it's, it's uh, carry the vision oh from gosh, company yeah. to company but it's never the same, I mean the yeah. choreographer is the creator mm -hmm. you know, I'm just the messenger, here's the step, this is the thought, this is the go mm -hmm. you know, and, but there's nothing like the creation mm -hmm. of that of art, mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm just a I love his work. I've always loved it. And, the and, ideas, so it's important to me. And Peter Pan's, you know, a full-length ballet, but there's definitely contemporary vocabulary in everything that you do. I mean, do you? Um, I guess this is sort of for both of you. Working with ballet dancers is is is. is it's not the only thing that you've done, Trey. Right? I mean, it, what are the challenges in getting ballet dancers, Tondu people, to do <laughs> what what you're looking to have them do? Um, well, you know, I, I think in some ways that speaks to part of the how dear my collaboration with Dawn has been over the years, and that she's. Um, I mean, I love that you bring up that example about the Kennedy Center because, like, you're the. One, that? I do, and I remember you're the one person you know I could say that to, and your reaction is like, "How do we fix it?" Like today, <laughs> like, like that's you know, like that's what I think that's what you live for as a dancer. But also, um, 
I think you were a pioneer in this company in terms of that level of versatility and being so open in yourself to, to other ways of moving and, and being hungry for it. Um, and I think that's, that's the situation in companies across the board more and more. Dancers are so required to do such, such different uh, movement. Um, I mean, that was another thing I really got from my relationship with Ben was, uh, it, I, it sounds like I'm saying he's always like pulling me back, but in some ways, really good ways. Um, you know, I, I am in the beginning when I did just blow up ballet, you know, it felt so restricted and as a creative person I wanted to throw it away in a certain way and you know, Ben was the one who kept saying remember your classical inheritance and remember this like don't forget this language that you have and I really have valued that as a base even when I work with contemporary companies to work still work from a place of not classical vocabulary, but that that a system of physics and that way of making out making sense of the human body um, is, is quite quite valuable. So um, those distinctions eat for a contemporary or a ballet company are, are, are less and less as time goes on. It's not much of a thing. Right. All right, let's turn our attention to pretty things. Um, oh, there's in dreams because I did that's not one we got to yet, but that's the most recent tray ballet to enter our repertoire um, in, in 2018. So is that when you, I mean, you had an opportunity just a couple of years ago to see the current crop of dancers. Is that when, had Stanton asked you, were you at, at that point, were you already thinking if I'm, if I'm gonna make another piece, it's gonna be with these dancers? Or? No, it wasn't actually until the company was in uh, Ejegu's Pillow performing in Dreams that he brought up coming to, to make a piece. So, so but it, you know, it was quite a sizable gap from the last time I'd been here to, yeah. to in Dreams. So essentially working w with a brand new company, that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So when he did approach you, where, where, where did you begin with your concept? I mean, it was uh, open. I'm assuming he was like, do what you want, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think I sound pretty woo-woo when I say this kind of thing, but it's it's true in terms of my process. Um, you know, this is a question somebody you will ask you'll ask me later probably. Um, like, do do I do I choreograph ahead of time and then te you know teach the movements? For me, I must choreograph at that moment. It must be at that moment. I've tried it every way. Um, you know, planning the whole ballet out, working the counts out, all that stuff. Um, but if it's not of that moment, then it's not of that moment. And I think, it's a, I think it's a very kind of Buddhist philosophy, but also one that is correct in terms of how it plays out. So when Stanton asks me, would you like to make a piece, it must be about what's going on at that moment. And so, so um, I was really chewing on this idea of what makes a performer. And what is it that you want to be on stage and you want to be seen, you want people to see you doing a thing um, I think I've had a lot of like hidden judgments about that throughout my life. I think part of why I stopped performing at such a young age is that I was judgmental of it in myself. And so I was coming to a point where like, you know, I just had my own dance company and even refused to be in front of that dance company. Kept, you know, I'm, I'm always pushing people out in front. And, and so I, it came to a moment where I was like, I need to reconcile that. I need to stop being judgmental of, especially the artists that I'm working with on a regular basis, that it's incredible that they're performers. Thank God that they want to be out in, in front. And so I wanted to make a piece that explored what's great about that. What's a, what's a way that it's not full of judgment about valuing that as a person? Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm kind of becoming known as a choreographer. I, I tend to use popular music. I like it. Um, I like music that's more from my time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I had really been listening to David Bowie's catalog quite a bit, probably more so since his death. And those things began to converge in my mind, and, and not on purpose, but uh, these, they're just there together, and that stew starts mixing up. And I could start to hear this idea in David Bowie's music. He's grand, he's a peacock, he, he fills up the room with that sound, and there is a showiness and a uh, glamour and a, um, and a look at me uh, quality to it. Yeah, so well, that he's a performer, or he was, excuse me, a performer for sure. For, yeah. for sure, and I ha I'll have to say too, it, it, it was also a real challenge in making this piece to not make it about David Bowie, um, especially, <clears throat> especially working with a designer. Like every day, he's like, "What if we have <laughs> lightning on their face?" I'm like, "No," I, because, because just as to what I was saying earlier, I don't want to make a piece using David Bowie's music stealing the things that he created. It still needed to honor him and his spirit and who he is, but there had to be something new to be, to be said with it. So to, to your point, yes, like to reflect the spirit of that and the music, but not doing it in the way that he did as a performer. And, and so you, that began to come 
together, right? You, Stanton asks you to do a piece. You're reflecting on what it means to be a performer and performative. You, David Bowie and that idea is converging. What, what was next in the process? Me, uh, engaging Thomas to make a set? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. I was, uh, I was thick in uh, two other productions with Thomas at the time, and our, we, we were new collaborators, but um, it had just been going so well that I just got him in on this one, too. And by the time you got him in on it, you, you knew it was going to be David Bowie? Yes. And so we've got a couple images of, of, of his design, um, not the actual set as it exists, but his, his concept. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah. So what you're looking at um, is a little bit the compromise between his desire to make it all David Bowie and mine to make it none. Um, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the piece uh, sort of begins as a birth, um, as a, like an explosion of planets, like the Big Bang. Um, but so the piece is 11 men, and it's kind of a reference to the fact that babies are narcissists. Um, babies don't know the difference between themselves and another person. We have to teach them that there's a separation. And so that was kind of my jumping in point. Like, we're born that way. So there's got to be something of value in it. And so, so he created this very, like, glamorous, you know, uh, constellation. And uh, there's planets that are made of disco balls and shooting stars and... It's cool. I, I just saw it just now, right before we saw it on stage for the first time, just before I came over here. So, like, Z Z Ziggy Stardust kind of moment for the for him, or for him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let while we're here, um, since we're talking about Thomas's design, um, we have a, a, one of the costumes. Um, I, I we have Connor and Harper here today, but their costumes are still under construction. So we have Hayden's costume. Um, and, I, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit about these. And I will, this is what Harper, they're all based on, all the bolero jackets are based on well-known paintings. So this is what Harper wears. And this is what Connor all wears. The, all the jackets, they each have their own individual print of a fine art painting uh, of a beautiful man. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then uh, upon that, they're more adorned, as you can see, with gold leaf and yeah. sparkle and Swarovskis and you name it. So the idea was to bring... Uh, so, uh, mm, I, are you a performer when you're inside of a frame, in a way? Uh, as a piece, you know, so to go back to this concept of um, exploring who performers are to be performative, is that the, the concept with the visual art, or is that you don't... Well, it's, it's really just to embellish, it's to embellish the self. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a decoration. Because there was many different incarnations of what would be printed on there, but um, we both like the simplicity of referencing that in a different era throughout the, throughout right. the work. So the, the paintings come from different eras, and they're all... Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And I, I've got... Uh, you'll have to... There's, there's, I can show you some others here. And they're abstracted, right? So again, it's not like, it's almost like your idea with David Bowie. It's not about that art. It's there, it's there and supportive. Yes, for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. So let's, so you, you already gave away that it's 11 men. So t why, why that, why did you decide that? I mean, that began from, I think this is in, in the ballet world. Um, and maybe someone will argue with me on the, I bet not the dancers won't, but I think that, that, <laughs> Better not. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, the, I think in the ballet world, uh, technique is geared toward men being showy. Um, you know, men are encouraged to do more pirouettes, jump higher, um, whereas the, a woman's role, a woman's role in technique is it's less showy or less like precision more. Or... Yeah, and I would go f further culturally. I think men are are asked to be in front in that way, where women are asked to be in front generally in the service of men. There's there there is that dynamic. So for me thinking about gender on stage, I always think of it as the metaphor. Mm -hmm. So it's, the, it's that masculine metaphor that we say, take, take your space mm -hmm. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that's how, I'm, that's how I'm using it in the piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like, I, always, I think I used this image with you guys. Um, I saw a children's dance class once where, and it was little kids, but it was getting, it was getting them to be, like, own the space. And the, he would have the kids come up and they'd go, my spot. And they would stomp and they would claim that spot on the earth. But it's really like, it's really the basis of a, of a dancer that you're engaged with, that they will own that space um, in front of them. So, so um, yeah, that, that choice was really just kind of like what, what, that, what that archetype might represent in terms of confidence in, um, in showing off. Yeah. And, and so you, um, 
had the idea for the concept, just melded it with David Bowie, worked with Thomas on the concept, and then you got here in January. Um, can we talk a little bit about the process with the dancers? And um, I'm open to all three of you chiming in on, 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 on this process. Do you want to start, Trey? Like what, you, know, you said you like to create in the moment, but first day. Yeah, uh, well, in the, you know, in the beginning, I had a lot of getting to know you to do. You know, there were so many dancers right. I hadn't really. I mean, even within Dreams, I wasn't here for a lot of time. You know, I didn't set it, so I had. So the first couple of days, I think, I spent just teaching some material and watching everyone, and um, just kind of getting to know them and talking a little bit about what my goal was with the piece, what 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 I was after. Um, and then we just plowed right into it. Uh, there's there's also a, us getting to know Trey. I mean, a lot of the company hasn't worked with Trey before, and when I have, it's also been in brief moments, so there's part of us learning how he throws out material, what's, what is his vocabulary, what is his expectations at this point, so th that element is also there for us, which is fun to kind of do as a group, and be like, okay, I think he wants this, you know, we, and we collectively do it, um, which is fun to kind of get to know each other like that. Um, yeah, so the first day that he was um, here with us for rehearsal, I remember a few of the more senior men in the company were kind of really starting to like warm up. They were starting to stretch and do all these things. And we were like, why are you guys getting ready so intensely for this? And he was like, just, or like Ian Cassidy, he's a principal. He was like, just get ready to dance. And, um, you know, and it, we were like, we were like, it's going to be fine, you know? And um, there's, there's just a high level of focus and that you have to, to have, and I had done, I actually worked with Dawn um, in uh, Peter Pan with Shadows and uh, the Pirates, and um, I did In Dreams last season, but this was my first new creation, and he comes in with this, I know what I want, and this is, and so when he delivers that, there's no time or room to be like, what do you mean? Or like, you know, like, what? It's just like, you kind of look at, I do, I dance with Connor a lot in it, and you kind of look and you say, okay, here we go. And um, it was very physical. It was, it was <laughs> nonstop dancing, but you feed off of his energy, and David Bowie music really, really helps to dance to. And um, so it's fun. And then we, we have five minute breaks, and after, at the five, it's, he's like, okay, sorry, we have to stop. And we kind of look at each other and run to water and like, how are we going to do two more hours of this? <laughs> um, that was just the first hour. But um, it's just so fun and it's so, um, it's so physical. And especially with, um, I just referenced uh, Shadows and Pirates. Those are two dances um, in Peter Pan that were all men. And um, it was so three-dimensional. It's not just forward-facing dancing. Um, and you have to rely on each person in that moment um, to kind of accomplish the patterns and stuff like that. And it was really interesting to see how he did that from a starting point. Um, and it was a lot of work. And I think there was one picture of Hayden in the air. Um, and w we would take it from that starting point a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but how to navigate that and how to make that work, that it's not just a body in the air, you know, it's just... Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's been really fun, but very, very, very physical. <laughs> so, I mean, the fact that it's an all, I mean, you guys did Azure Barton's piece last year, which was another all male piece. What, what is that dynamic? I mean, you do spend a lot of your year lifting up and supporting women. So how does, how does that feel in the studio? You know, even in the pieces that, that are being created on you very often, you're, you're playing that, not playing, you, you, you have a supportive of a female role. How, tell, talk a little bit about the all-male factor. Uh, I mean, I think it's something that we enjoy. I think a lot of, when young guys get into dance, usually one of the things that keeps them around is getting them around to other guys in dance. And there's this great kind of competitive camaraderie where we're always pushing each other. And I think that that's really important. And as soon as you start doing an all-male piece, there is, you know, the testosterone starts going and everybody starts pushing each other. Um, so that's something that's really enjoyable. And as I'm learning, Trey talks at a pace that, he also choreographs. He's, you can see he's so much momentum and, and forward thinking and it's, it's fantastic working with him in the studio that we're all constantly trying to um, stay focused and engaged as Harper's mentioning. And, and I've, sorry to switch gears a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about how Trey, he, how quickly he choreographs is very different than a lot of things that I've worked with because a lot of chore choreographers kind of 
get stuck on moments. And you can have a rehearsal where you'll just focus on one step for an hour. You know, and Trey, I'm learning a little bit that it's how prepared he is, but he also has this momentum that seems to propel him um, with pace. And he, po uh, he sort of choreographs broadly with like painting with strokes rather than getting the face perfectly right and then moving onto the arm. It's, and we can't all see the picture and it slowly starts to reveal itself. It's like, which I think is a lot of fun for us. So basically, I mean, I'm just in fr from interpreting what you're saying, like you're moving faster than necessarily, you're, you're, you're not necessarily fully like, oh, this is exactly what I'm doing here. We're still moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, like I've choreographed a little bit and I think making one step is really hard. Yeah. And, and Trey hasn't, there's not a lot of themes. There's so many, so much original material in this, in this piece. There's so many fantastic steps, uh, clever ideas, there's humor, there's personality. Um, and it, there's an abundance of creativity in the, in the space and within the work, um, which I think is really admirable because I know I'll get into the studio and try and choreograph and I'll be like, Tondu, you know? And, and they'll be like, how's that, guys? So, you know? It, no, it, no, I just understand that challenge, how difficult that is. And it's really admirable and impressive to work with somebody who goes with such pace um, and doesn't seem to overly censor themselves because they're prepared and know, know what they want. So in terms of, uh, um, I'm wondering if you feel the two of you that you, that you play yourselves or you have a character in the, in the ballet. Um, I, uh, a bit of both. I, I think we sort of start, because as Trey mentioned, we start sort of as a baby, sort of discovering ourselves, discovering the world that's around us. Um, sort so of discovering the audience, which in the studio is kind of fun because we're discovering the mirror, and then you're also discovering yourself again. Mm -hmm. So there's this, the narcissism is sort of there, and even within the first movement, you start to enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. You start to enjoy your own physicality, enjoy uh, the way you are moving, the way you're discovering to move. Um, and then as the piece kind of unfolds, we sort of, the camaraderie starts to come out, the relationships between the men start to come out, both um, playfully and complicated and um, competitive and intense. Uh, and then by the end, there is sort of a, um, a completion where it does feel like Trey's allowing us to be a bit more of ourselves, a bit more playful, a bit more supportive. Um, so there's this kind of great arc, which is sort of as he's referenced to the piece, that um, performers is something that he admires, but also something that it's strange. So I think that those are, are both those things are reflected in the piece. Um, yeah, good job. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, yeah, it's, it's really, it's in there. You know, like that's, a, it's really great because a lot of times you don't, it's not always clear to us or it takes lots of viewings, but um, uh, it's, it's quite, I think it'll be quite clear to you, especially after listening to him tonight. Yeah. What about you, Harper? Um, it's, first I'll say that it's incredibly exciting watching we're not all in each and every movement. Um, and so when you're sitting on the side or you're catching your breath, um, you, I, see, I see real, honest people. I don't necessarily see Connor, I don't see Oliver, but um, I see uh, real people. And I don't see a character. Um, but him speaking about the role of man and, uh, and women in, in ballet, I think it's really interesting that if you were to have two women on stage embrace or hold each other and partner, your brain does one thing. But if you have two men do it, I, will say, I, I think that the, uh, how people would interpret it might be different. Um, and what he does so beautifully is it's neither here nor there, it's right in the middle. And um, it's just two people, three people, four people, all men. Um, encountering each other. Um, and the ebb and flow of the emotions is there, but um, it's so, it's just, it's just very, very real. Um, and with Azure's piece, I think also what he was saying, the bravoure of men and um, like, we all had to turn that down in Azure's. I mean, Connor was dancing <laughs> throughout the whole thing, but you know, a lot of us were just, it was just a slight head nod or a, a hand gesture. And it was so nuanced and it was a lot of work to turn down the performance of it. Um, and in this, what's exciting is we are running, we are jumping, we are leaping, catching, partnering men, jumping off the rostrum, 
um, but we're also holding each other, supporting each other, having to make eye contact. Um, and so it's like, this is, I, I think, a great next step for the men in the company um, in the progression of not just the Don Q, not just the Albrecht, um, but- In terms of what, what it means to be bravura? Yeah, and just, but, and also it's been so exciting because I mean, the doors open in the studio and people pop their heads in and they're kind of like, uh, oh, what is happening? <laughs> and they stay and like, I'm, <laughs> Dawn, I will never forget the first day. She was like in the window. Second movement, she was in the door. <laughs> Third movement, she was leaning against the bar. And then f by the end, she was front by the mirror being like. <laughs> and it's just, and I think that that, <laughs> and what is, yeah, she's going to be dancing. But what is, I think that's so important to have work like that. And I remember joining Houston Ballet and seeing Stanton's Clear and being like, I have to do that. I want to do that. And that pushed me in class, in rehearsal. If I was on the side as a court man in Sleeping Beauty, I was like, I will work on this to get to Clear. And now being a soloist and dancing with this, this ballet, I think it's so great to have a, a ballet like this for the school to see and for other men to see and other young dancers to see that you can have a career, you can have a job professionally dancing this awesome ballet and that it's fun and it's and exciting and I think that that is and a, it's incredible. Real. And it's real and it's a, that's a, a huge motivation for, um, people to step into the studio and to um, want to be take part. So you didn't just create a ballet, you created inspiration for the next generation. Very nice, Trey McIntyre. <laughs> so I think we'll give Harper the last word on that and turn it over to the audience, unless there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, OK. All right, so um, you know how this works. Um, if you ask a question, I'm going to take a moment to repeat it into the microphone um, so that everybody can hear. So who wants to start? Yes, sir. Bowie has such a large catalog of music. I'm just curious how you came up with whatever you selected for this dance. Was it your favorites, or was it something that you thought you would be able to choreograph from, or just how did you come up with that process? OK, so the question is um, the selection of the Bowie songs that ended up in this, in this piece. How did it come about? Um, it was really all the things you suggested. It's, it's a matter of, um, you know, I just listened to everything. Um, I tried not to stick only to the hits, but that's kind of what I ended up coming back to. Um, yeah, and, and just seeing what it was I wanted to sit with for the period of time that it would take to make the piece. I tried to not stick to a single album or a period of time. I tried to vary in that way, it, it, but still let it be cohesive, but just had to kind of play around. Were they songs that, that, that particularly spoke to that performative concept? Um, I did not intend that um, because I don't really listen, for pop music, I don't generally listen to the lyrics um, because I think usually upon first hearing, you can't hear them. And so it, 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 it wants to not be a secret code that you have to li like listen along in to get the story. Um, I tend to think of pop music as more like it's the song that was playing while this, while X was happening in my life, not that it is the narration for, for my life. Um, so it's more responding to the feeling of what a song is. But there are definitely songs in the piece that I'm listening to and I'm like, I must have picked that on purpose because of the lyrics, because it actually really does support the idea. But I do think it is a testament to the ability of David Bowie as a performer and how the sound of the music inhabits what the, what the song is actually communicating. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I have, I'm curious about, you were very prepared, but it was also in the now. So did you select the dancers ahead of time, and did you know what you were going to have them do, or what, what was prepared? So the question is that, um, I think Connor was really alluding to the fact that Trey was so prepared in, for every rehearsal, which made it the momentum and the, the choreographic pace be quite fast. But at the same time, Trey was saying, um, he likes to choreograph, he can't really choreograph ahead of time, it's gotta be in the moment. So how did, what was your process in terms of picking the dancers and knowing yeah, what you were gonna do? That's such a great question because I, I think it's, it's getting into a thing that I'm learning about dance that um, 
the movement's not the only thing, and it's not even the main thing. Um, it's, you know, if we, if we were to think of all art as the same, the thing that's the same is the meaning and what's being communicated and what's being shared between what's on the stage and the audience. The, the steps are the words that Shakespeare comes up with. They're the notes that David Bowie writes. Um, so it's all the other stuff I'm prepared with. What, is, what do I want to figure out in this piece? Really understanding, not necessarily the outcome, what that would be, but what do I want to figure out while I'm in the room? Um, I'll create an architecture of, I'm pretty sure this section will have three men and it's gonna, it's, it's actually, the picture in my mind is more sculptural. Um, you know, if it was a blob, what would that blob be like? But not the details of it. Um, knowing what the stage space looks like, being really clear on the design, being really clear on what's happening in the music. So I more or less have it memorized. Um, so that, and then also I will conjure up a lot of just source material, um, random things that support that idea. Just so there's this treasure chest to draw, draw from. So when I'm in the moment and these two guys are standing in front of me, there'll be something to respond to. I'll have ev ev all, the, all the colors in the paint box are right here with me so that my instinct is in informed by all of those things. And then the step will just be what the step is in, in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's done ahead of time. Yeah, I, I came earlier in the year dur during something, Nutcracker made me, um, just to watch, watch rehearsals. And it was so great because they were rehearsing Azure's piece, so all the men were in their, their <laughs> room together, so. So the question is about the narrative. If it starts with birth, does it does it arc all the way through death? Is it is it? Are we looking at a lifespan and why and why and why eleven and why and how are the eleven showing that? Um, <clears throat> it's it's not a lifespan. Um, I certainly considered that when I, when I was developing the idea, starting from birth, the you know the natural inclination would, would be to follow a life. But I didn't. I actually ended up deciding that didn't serve the the concept. Um, it was really the, the, it was the birth relationship to what is our relationship to our separation from people, our separating ourselves, utilizing that. Um, there's not so much a narr narrative, there's not a story, but it is a poetic narrative in that there are specific things. If you, if you were to think that you're seeing my mind play out, it's, it's me musing through these things and playing out ideas with a certain progression. Um, it comes more to not, here's how I would probably sketch it really broad strokes, um, not understanding separation, learning separation and falling in love with it, pushing yourself to the front, and then trying to re-reconcile that and to merge back again. And I, this, was what I, this is what I learned from it, and I think this is what really came from you guys, as Connor was talking about what that camaraderie is in the room. What we represent as performers is us. And so it's this feeling of all of us, me stepping forward is you stepping forward. I'm playing out all of our, by being a performer, I'm playing out all of our archetypes and giving an audience the opportunity to see them, themselves played out. So the full circle is not birth to death, but it's, it's separation to reconnection. Um, that's kind of what the journey ended up being for me. And, and I, I'm telling you, like, I really do figure these things out in a dance piece. Um, you know, I, I can't really speak about it until afterward, but I did that for, I mean, in the course of this, I decided to start a YouTube channel. Um, that's a shameless plug. You guys should go check out my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, really, it was like, I, oh, here's a way that I can put myself in front and I can speak for my own creativity and I can, I can be the person uh, uh, doing it. And it was a definite outcome of working on this piece. So the question is about um, how much language versus movement is used to, in, during the creation of a piece. And, and I think also <clears throat> actually like sharing what it is I'm getting after. Yeah. Um, 
So that has gotten to be more so over time. It used to be almost nothing. Uh, and the reason for that is I don't want to rely on the dancers to have to act out my idea. I want to make sure that it is, imp imp as best I can, impossible to not dance it in a way that supports the idea. So that onus must be on me first. Um, I will judiciously dole that out when I think it's necessary to, to help a dancer color a certain movement. Um, but if I can get out of the way of their own best instincts, I think that's better because otherwise they're approximating what they think I want as opposed to having their own more authentic experience that will probably be more engaging in the end. But, but I, I'm erring more on the side of saying I'm a little bit better about sharing uh, more now than I used to be. Do you guys want to say anything about that? Well, I would just add that I, I think, like Don referenced, Trey uses a lot of imagery, right? And that imagery is really important to understanding like a gem general theme within a movement or just a specific moment. Rather than, you know, each rehearsal we sit down and, and talk for 20 minutes. I mean, I, th I think we wish we had the time to do so, but um, it's sort of little ideas and little seeds that he plants along the way and you sort of help connect the dots and as he, he gives you these little pieces of visualizations for in this step could it be a little more this and you say oh, okay and then you sort of will reinterpret your next couple steps and l l how you're looking at your partner with that little bit of information oh he's pushing nudging me towards this way um, so less with Trey at least and with most choreographers it's less of you know we sit down and, and discuss like this it's sort of little moments and with this step here and then the dancer sort of takes it and carries it I agree. <laughs> no, um, I just, I was, I was going to say that, um, I don't know if it's because he's a product of Houston Ballet. I have, I've only danced in Houston Ballet for my career, but um, you, you quickly learn here that it's much more than the steps and um, it's much more than the tondu. And it's what are you saying with the tondu and what are you saying um, with the, the movement and you know it's something that I still struggle with and think about and um, try to apply to my dancing but um, the space in the studio I feel like now I'm comfortable or more comfortable to make a choice and to uh, try something um, so yes we have this solo but what what are you doing with it and I think that um, just with experience and time and uh, the rep that we dance here and uh, the coaches we have from full length to uh, mixed rep that when you hear the music and then he kind of g gave us a little bit of a, like a little bit of like an appetizer of, to what the, the piece was gonna be about, then it's our job to kind of start the wheel turning of how we're going to um, interpret it and to try it and um, um, if it doesn't work, he says something, and if it does, I think that he kind of just continue building on that. And um, it's really been fun to develop that, not just in um, his work, but in all the work that we get to um, dance here. So it's, 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 it's definitely um, a building process, but it's a, also I feel like we're, I'm in a space where I'm allowed to um, make a choice and um, be vulnerable to um, take it beyond the steps. I think we have time for one more. Jean. What is the role of the mirrors in the studio when you're working? Um, if this is a piece about <clears throat> self-awareness and narcissism uh, and, and being creating the, creating the ballet, there won't be mirrors in the theater, but there are while you're creating. How does that play into all this? The, the question's about how uh, the, the mirror is used in, in, in the creation process, and particularly for this piece, if it's about d discovering yourself and narcissism, and, but then the mirrors aren't there in the, in the, in the theater. Um, that's so interesting in that way. You know, for me, the mirror's behind me, so I don't really have an idea of it being in the room, and I think most of what I've communicated to them is about being aware of the audience. And so um, you guys can probably speak more so if that has any inf in effect on it, but that, that hasn't been a part of my... Well, I just found there was something circular about that, that we're talking about narcissism and I'm supposed to be looking out and then I'll also, oh, I found myself again. You know, it's just sort of this accidental moment. Um, 
And dancers, we live constantly in front of mirrors. It's just part of our life, and there is a lot of narcissism in the dance world because of that, for better or worse. And, and that's just part of our reality constantly, and, and it's both a bad habit as well as it is a tool um, for us to just make sure I'm under, you know, he says, I want the step to be more like that. Well, I'm using the mirror just to try and get it more like that, but then I'm also narcissistically staring at myself for 10 minutes, you know? So there's, it's a bit of both. So Trey, um, we're about to wrap up, and I wondered if there are any last thoughts that you want these folks to carry with them into the theater when they say pre see pretty things. Uh, well, yeah, this is the same thing I would say about any piece, which is, all these things we're saying, feel free to forget all of it. Um, be because um, you are uh, an equal partner in what ends up on stage. Um, I think that's one of the really beautiful things about dance. What you bring to it, how you hold your life up to that mirror in that way, what you see in it based on your own experience and what you bring to it, just like you do with any, any interaction, is what the piece is. And I, I want you to feel fully entitled to that perspective and, and not have to subscribe to, to any of it. Well, please thank Trey McIntyre and my illustrious panel. And we'll see you at the theater starting next weekend.